So, uh, so I'd like to begin tonight with a challenge. Uh, in the publication you found on your seat as you returned from break in an adult beverage, uh, you should open the inside, or you may have already discovered there's a dollar bill. Yes, you can attend a Mount Vernon event and actually make money as opposed to give money. <laughs> so here's the challenge. If you can refrain for the duration of my talk from texting, tweeting, checking your Facebook, or doing some early Christmas shopping online, you get to keep the dollar. If you cannot refrain, if that dopamine boost is so strong that you have to check that text, and certainly I understand parents, you might have to do that, then either donate the dollar to Mount Vernon or leave it on your desk, and I will take it back to Maryland uh, tonight. Everybody understand the challenge? Fair enough. Now, I'm not going to tell you why we're doing the challenge yet, but hopefully this talk will show you ways and the purpose behind this challenge that I actually start each of my classes at the beginning of the year with. Now, to order, in order to understand this challenge, I want you to take a look at this image. What do you see in this image? Not a rhetorical question. I actually want an answer. Shout it out. You see a brain. It's a sheep's brain, not a human brain. Excuse me? Science. Science. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? One or two others? Collaboration. Smiles. Now let's stop there. Last June, my two colleagues, along with 100% of the St. Andrews Episcopal School faculty, in their continual learning about how the brain learns, works, changes, and thrives, worked on dissecting a sheep's brain to better understand the anatomy of the human brain. And what I love about this photo if you're a teacher, or if you've ever in your career gone to a professional development workshop, how many times have you had a smile ear to ear? And it's also a reminder that adults like to learn in many of the same ways we know is best for children, collaboratively, hands-on, and with something that challenges them. Eliza said she's never dissected a sheep's brain, but jumped into it with scissors and gloves. Now, the journey to that picture began for my school 10 years ago when we asked ourselves a really big generative question, not surprisingly during a strategic planning process. And this was the question, what is the next frontier for teacher training to taking our great teachers and making them exceptional? And our answer was mind, brain, and education science. Like many schools, we had experience some really important initiatives along the way. Social and emotional learning, STEM, STEAM, design thinking, whatever you want to call it, multicultural education. And these were critical initiatives to our school. But none would transform our practice in ways that educational neuroscience has. None would transform the reputation of our school, not only regionally, but internationally. And most importantly, None of our initiatives would transform how our teachers think of themselves as professionals and experts in the craft of teaching. Now, the importance of this initiative at our school really hit home with me when I had a personal experience that has nothing to do with the brain. So here's my story. About three years ago, when I was starting to write co-author the book NeuroTeach with my colleague, I had self-diagnosed that I had a hernia. Now, the only reason why I'm telling you guys this is because one, I don't know you, and two, <laughs> I will probably never see you again. So I self-diagnosed as a hernia, and I was in the car. Remember, I'm in the process of writing this book about the brain and learning, and I'm driving to Dr. Cullen's office off Wisconsin Avenue. That is his real name, because he knows I'm drumming up business for him in Atlanta. Um, and I play out this potential scenario I'm going to have with Dr. Cullen. So I go in the office, I say, Doc, I think I have a, a hernia. And I hope Dr. Cullen looks me over and can confirm my diagnosis. And then I hope Dr. Cullen says something along the lines of, Glenn, I love your hernia. I care deeply about your hernia. I want what's best for your hernia. Would we want our doctor to say that? Probably on some emotional level, 
and relational level, that'd be good. But then I would have to ask him a follow-up question. And my follow-up question to Dr. Cullen would be this. Doc, have you ever studied the hernia? Now, if Dr. Cullen says no, what's my next decision? I'm hoping all of us would find another doctor. Well, the reality for our students in public, public charter, private schools across the country, is they are being educated by teachers who love them, who know their subject excellently, care deeply and passionately about their students. But they have one gap in their training. They do not have formal knowledge in the organ of learning, the brain. How the brain learns, works, changes, and most importantly, thrives. So our school believes so deeply in this that we actually developed a research center on our campus, the Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning, that is now 12 weeks opened. So like the other invitations you got, on your way to San Diego, stop by Potomac, Maryland. <laughs> Though I might already be in San Diego. And our center ensures that 100% of our teachers, every single one, preschool through 12th grade, has training and ongoing professional development every year they're at the school in how the brain learns, works, changes, and thrives. We are a leader in this. But we also want to share our expertise and our experience. Now, as we went into this work, again, we knew our teachers knew their stuff. I teach history. I know my content. But I wanted to know how can I make it stick better and longer. My biggest fear at an alumni reunion in 30 or 40 years with my students is this. I teach LBJ really well. Now, I know he's complex president of the United States, but I know I teach LBJ well. My biggest fear is at an alumni reunion, 40 years, and I go up to one of my students, and I ask him or her, who's LBJ? And they say LeBron James. <laughs> I'm a little worried of how good a teacher I was. So as a school, we immediately had to start to navigate this world. We are being inundated as educators with these kind of terms. Brain-based, brain-friendly, research-informed, brain-enhanced, brain-targeted, you name it. You can't go to an educational conference in the United States without sessions on the brain and learning, which is a good thing. But the problem is there's a lot of neuromarketing out there in a million-dollar brain training industry. And there's a lot of neuro myths that teachers still hold on to that we need to break. So let me do this with you. One of the great pieces of research that we love is around movement. And what we started seeing with our own faculty is lower school students moved a lot. But as you got older, you moved less. So let's practice that with you guys. We're going to bring in some movement to tonight if this is truly a brain-friendly presentation. So if you believe this statement is true, you will stand. If you do not believe it's true, I would like you to remain seated. So statement one. Human brains seek and often quickly detect novelty. Stand if you believe it's true. Remain seated if you think it's false. I know there's some peer pressure involved in this activity, but <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. The answer is true. And I hope that dollar bill moment was novel enough to engage your brain a little differently in this talk. Second one. There's only three. Get ready. And this is controversial, and you guys... We all think some way in this. <laughs> some people are able to multitask. If you believe this is true, stand up. If you believe it's not, remain seated. Currently, the answer is false. <laughs> Through fMRI studies, the brain is only really doing one task at a time. And here's my best case study. Ten years ago, if you were driving and blasting Bruce Springsteen, I'm from New Jersey, on the radio, and you got lost, what's the first thing you do as you try to figure out where you are? You turn off the radio, right? We, we fail to monotask enough with our students. And I know we think we can multitask, but the reality is we can go deeper in learning if we can train students to monotask. And we value that and model that as adults, which is nearly an impossible challenge. Last one. 
Stand if it's true. Remain seated if it's false. Learning is enhanced by challenge and inhibited by threat. If you believe this is true, stand up. If you don't, remain seated. The answer is true. Thank you very much for playing. Now, we have to dispel the neural myths that exist in our school. They are actually detrimental pedagogy. They are hurting and paralyzing all kids, meeting their peak potential. So the most important piece of research that I want to seed here tonight with parents and with the FET teachers and with the school leaders is around neuroplasticity. Now, I don't know if you know about plasticity. The brain is not actually plastic. Let's, let's dispel that, okay? And I'm not talking about plastic in the form of Legos, right? I, I love Legos. I collect Legos. I still have a lot of Legos, right? But the brain is changeable. And the good news for all of us adults in the audience, it's changeable until we die. Maybe a little harder to take up golf at the age of 40, right? And there are sensitive periods of brain development. That's why we should honor lower school teachers and the amazing work they do from the earliest ages. But this is great news but it requires a mindset from teachers and researchers that is not actually common amongst educators today. Why? Because they don't know the research well enough. So we also realized we could not do this work alone. And the power of partnerships has been transformative for our school and center. So not surprisingly, when we began this work, we took a quick drive up I-95 from DC to Baltimore. Um, I think the traffic's as bad as Atlanta. Um, I would like to compete with you. I think it might be even worse some days. And we actually, I'll just say it, I think we stalked Dr. Mariel Hardiman in the most legal sense possible. <laughs> Dr. Mariel Hardiman is probably the leading researcher in this space. And she was like us. She didn't want great research to sit entombed in stuffy journals just so uh, postdocs can get tenure. She wanted it to be applied in the classroom. And she wanted to work with us in this way. And then we were the eighth school in the world, invited by Research Schools International, led by Harvard Graduate School of Education faculty, to do original research at our school. And here's what it looks like. Here was one of the first research studies we did on our campus. This is second grade students and third grade students. They are sitting around Dr. Luke Rinney from Johns Hopkins. They had just spit into a cup as we collected Saliva samples. Now, that in itself was a hard process. Forget the science behind it. But look at the engagement of these kids. There is a university professor with lower school students measuring stress compounds in spit. Because here's what we wanted to look at. How does student happiness shape their motivation and their academic achievement? I think our school's a lot like Mount Vernon. You shouldn't have to choose between a happy school and a challenging school. And a matter of fact, that's the secret sauce to a great school. And they're complementary. So how do you create these environments? We did it through partnerships. And here's what has happened at our school. Ten years ago, I would say I was probably a lousy teacher compared to how I do today. I was very traditional. And, but this is what's happened with our faculty. We had this hypothesis when we start this work. If we give our teachers more research on how the brain learns and works and changes, they will start doing more of the innovative work that we're hearing tonight and that Mount Vernon actually models excellently. We have a design thinking program. We give student choice on tests to demonstrate their knowledge in ways that they feel will do best. We have our students reflect and think about their learning experiences before and after. We've redesigned learning spaces. We've integrated mindfulness training. We've differentiated instruction and assessment. We would never have been in that place if it wasn't for being a research-informed school. So here's our bigger goal, though. We are taking excellent care of our faculty. And the reason why I gave you this publication is because it tells our story in two pages each of how teachers use research to inform their practice. And my challenge for all the educators in this room is I would love your schools or your programs to create your own Think Differently and Deeply. Because we have our faculty write this publication. We've distributed 10,000 of these 
oh, in seven years of volume one and two. But here's our bigger goal. And this is sort of where I need your help. Our goal is to collaborate with, work with, present to 20,000 teachers by 2020. That's a big, ambitious goal. And we're not really ready to take this on yet. But we have developed an idea. And to be honest, I've used some of Bo's and, and your, your, uh, your work to start designing this. Don't get worried about all the complexity of it, but essentially it's this. We want to take teachers and school leaders from a novice understanding of research and on brain learns to a school leader or teacher leader level. Because that should be the expectation parents should have for the teachers in front of their students or the teachers who are collaborating or inspiring their kids. And we have a long way to go. This is, this is out of our comfort zone. I heard about comfort. We are not comfortable building this. I actually have no clue how to build this. So I have to find partners and allies. If you're in the audience, I'll give you my card at the end. And if you're not, I hope the opportunity is to collaborate and work together further down the road. And here's one thing. This is totally a sheepish moment, right? Um, when we were writing our book last spring, our publisher gave us these two versions of our cover. What's the difference in the two versions of the cover? Okay, one has a brain that's so big, it's falling off the cover. And we did this very intentionally, and here's why. Research on teachers, there's been a few studies that have looked at this, shows that a teacher or school leader will believe a book on this topic is more valuable and useful if it has both the word brain on it and a picture of the brain on it. <laughs> now, I say that cautiously because we only use research that has been replicated, and that's really important because there's a lot of research that hasn't been done well, and there's a lot of neural myths and neural marketing out there. So hopefully you'll buy the book. They're back there. Um, but if not, if you just look at the cover, remind you to be mindful as you look at ways to use research to inform your practice. So finally, how'd you do? I'm curious. Was the dollar novel enough for you to withhold looking and using your phone or your electronic device? Was the incentive, the challenge, strong enough to keep you from looking at the phone? Because my question for you is, not only how's Mount Vernon using a research-informed dollar challenge to bring novelty to their students, but how are you doing it in your own work, in your own life? So all I want to do is leave you with one simple message. The organ of learning is the brain. It is our responsibility as teachers and school leaders to understand and translate and apply research about how the brain learns, works, thrives, and changes. Because every day, every child in every classroom deserves a teacher who knows the research and the science behind learning. Thank you very much.